everybody, welcome to the Michael Steele podcast. Well, you know, it's that time where you got to get a little bit off the sides and maybe a little bit off the top. You got to clean it up, shape it up, flip it, whip it, make it look good. It's that time, the barbershop conversation. I'm excited about it. Can't wait to have it. We're going to get into some politics and the typical crazy that makes it all work. Um, I'm going to be joined by John Fugelsang, uh, actor, comedian, and host of Sirius XM's Tell Me Everything and the John Fugelsang podcast. My good friend, Jonathan Capehart, Pulitzer Prize, Prize winning uh, journalist, former member of the Washington Post editorial board and MSNBC contributor and the anchor of the Saturday show and the Sunday show with Jonathan Capehart and my good friend, Tara Setmayer, former CNN uh, political commentator, uh, senior advisor at the Lincoln Project and host of the live show, The Breakdown. They all come on together and yeah, we break it down. Stay tuned for a lot of fun. Grab a drink. You're going to need it on this one, folks. Right coming up next on the Michael Steele Podcast. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Barbershop with Michael Steele. Uh, such a treat for you to drop by and get a little off the sides and get a little bit off the top. <laughs> you don't want to do like I didn't take too much because it, it's not good. It's not good. But, you know, of course, we've got John Fugel saying who's got, you know, curls and, you know, no gray and it's looking like he's 27 and, you know, and then there's Jonathan. So... <laughs> <laughs> And then I'm the guy's girl who gets to hang out. And the then, of course, we have this guys. gorgeous Tara <laughs> Satmeyer, Jonathan Capot, John Fugel saying, welcome all of you to the podcast. So great you could be with me. Oh, thanks. This is Always fun. fun. Yeah. So, okay, so let's let's just sort of recap where we are. Uh, Kevin McCarthy has dropped 44,000 videos on the January 6th um, insurrection into Tucker Carlson's mailbox like it was a Beyonce single. You've got, um, uh, what else? You've got, oh, Ronna, Romney McDaniels is uh, now requiring all Republican uh, presidential nominees to take a loyalty oath. Uh, and Marjorie Taylor Greene wants to succeed from the union and, and break the country apart uh, because, well, because she's Marjorie. Uh, and it's only Tuesday. So um, what what are we to make of this current and continuing implosion of Republican governance in this country from the irresponsibilities of the Speaker of the House in doing what he did with those videos to the just madcap bullshit from Marjorie Taylor Greene, which every day on top of that, uh, offending our senses with a workout video, which hit hit the Twitter yesterday. I don't know if you saw that one. Um, uh, no. Yeah, well, no, you really don't. He's back to, to the pull-up things again. Yeah, the pull-up to... thing. So oh, I, I don't know. Uh, Lots of prayers. Lots Fugel of prayers. saying, what, what's your take on this, on this crazy man? You know, I'll never get tired of watching Kevin McCarthy trying to make people who hate him like him. And that's pretty <laughs> much what this is all about uh, and has been for a very long time. Um, as far as Ronna McDaniel, you know, once upon a time, way, way back, way, way back, there was a man named Reince Priebus. Yeah. Uh, and every, every man <laughs> over 50 should get his Reince Priebus checked once a year, by the way. Um, and Reince Priebus had a pretty similar idea of making all the Democratic, uh, all the Republican presidential candidates for the long forgotten year of 2016 sign a similar pledge. Uh, Reince Priebus bought his little piece of paper. He printed it out up to Trump Tower uh, and waved it around that he had gotten Donald Trump to behave and be part of a team. And in the very next debate, they asked all the Republicans, who will, will will any of you agree uh, to to support whoever it is? And Donald Trump was the only one who didn't, um, even though he had signed Reince Priebus's magical piece of paper. So it's great <laughs> that Anna has her own magical piece of paper. And you know what? I, they're they're all just waiting to see whether Ron DeSantis implodes because he got too racist too early. That's the only horse race we're seeing here. Will DeSantis completely? disintegrate before he can take this away from Trump? And does Nikki Haley have a shot at beating Tim Scott for the VP nod for either of those two gentlemen? Otherwise, not much they do surprises me. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, that, that 
pretty much sums up exactly the play with the piece of paper. I mean, I think you know you'd be better off writing it on a piece of Charmin and and getting as about, about as much use out of it. Um, in terms of and, and of course, Reince has a history with pieces of paper because not only did we have that, but we had the so-called autopsy, uh, which was right. another piece oh. of paper which yes. Donald Trump summarily shot all over mm -hmm. um, uh, four years later. So, Tara, I, I you know you. <laughs> You're still trying to pull me out. I'm still on the front porch with my light, my light bulb, trying to keep keep the damn lights on. Um, but and a rifle too. And a rifle. <laughs> yes, I got a rifle too. Yeah, locked and loaded. Locked and loaded. Locked and loaded. How how do how do we how do we assess how should Americans you know the, on Earth One look at what we see happening now? You know, as as John laid out, you know this 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 is an ongoing series. This is not something that oh, this is a new episode. It really is kind of almost a repeat of what we've seen before. But they can continue to roll it out, um, and the press especially falls into the trap of treating like it's some treating it like it's something new uh, and interesting. But in reality, it isn't. How do, how do you assess uh, this moment? It, it's um. There's so many things converging right now, um, especially this week, right? You have the the Ronna McDaniel um, pledge on Sunday, like, oh yeah, we're gonna have to. And it, like like you said, it's not worth the, the paper it's written on that Donald Trump doesn't give two shits about that. So it, they're trying, it's just a performative um, pro forma thing that the RNC chair does. You know this, um, um, Michael, from when you, when you, back in the normal days, when you were chairman, there were just certain things that you did that weren't that controversial. It wasn't even that big of a deal to have a loyalty right. pledge or anything like that, because it was just pretty much understood. But now they're trying to go back to make it seem like some of this is normal, the way the media covers it, as if we're back in a normal horse race. Nothing right. about this is normal. And we've been saying this forever. And part of the frustration that I have as I watch this national nightmare continue to unfold. It's like Groundhog Day, but the horror version. It's that the media continues to fall for this. Like they desperately want to frame it as if we're in a normal political um, uh, presidential race, the horse race that we see, and we're not. Stop normalizing this. Stop normalizing Ron DeSantis as if he's just he's the the, the Bush style well, yeah, like establishment he's some, candidate. Like a normal governor from Florida, he's not. Right. I mean, he's a normal not. governor, oddly, ironically enough, is a Larry Hogan from from Blue State, yes. Maryland. Yes. If you want to talk about yes. Republican governors, right? Or 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 Charlie Baker up there in in Massachusetts, in Massachusetts. or somewhere. You know, like those were what we consider to be normal Republicans, not. Today, Ron DeSantis is a fascist wannabe who is masquerading as some establishment figure. We saw Jeb Bush come out and say, yeah, he's a great governor. And then he's like, wait, wait, no, I didn't endorse him. I just said he was doing a great job. <laughs> come on, come on. You know, what are we doing here? And you've got DeSantis running well, around with his Jackie Kennedy reincarnate wannabe wife, running his campaign, letting him borrow her, you know, her, her boots for, for photo ops, thinking it's cute. He's got this book out that's Photoshopped. They gave him a jaw. Like, I mean, uh, stop. Like, uh, stop with this uh, whole uh, thing. He's got damn. Selena Zito, right? He's got Selena Zito riding the Western Pennsylvania roots, infringing on Trump territory type of stories. The guy is getting ready to announce president. He's going to run for president. And it's all going to fall apart as soon as Donald Trump aims his cannons at him and Trump world takes him out. Ron DeSantis does not have what it takes to take on Trump world. Have we looked at the polls? Well, he does. Trump yeah, he, is still beating him considerably. Yeah, by double digits. And mm -hmm. and Jonathan, that that therein lies the rub. Because when you look at, before we actually dig a little bit, because both fuel saying and... and um, uh, Tara had some great some great quotes on on uh, uh, presidential candidates, uh, which I want to play in a moment. But bef before I get in that, I want to sort of set it up with continuing with this sort of cavalcade of crazy, which you have uh, documented over the past uh, few years with some zest uh, in in your writings at the Post. But it is intriguing to me when you look at how this stacks up. You've got, you, you've got, as I noted, Rana trying to tame tame the shrew, um, and I don't mean Marjorie Taylor Greene, but rather you know the Republican candidates that that are hoping to get on the stage. 
But then you've also got, you know, the meltdown of someone like Scott Adams, uh, the, you know, the, the guy behind the Dilbert cartoon and his oh, racist, that guy. yeah, that, that guy. guy, his racist screed this week, but then to watch Republicans sort of, you know, already begin to sort of put foam around him so he doesn't land <laughs> as hard um, because of that. But then you've got our, one of our favorites, of course, um, none other than the, the, the congressman from New York who not only split the atom, but invented the banana split. Um, and, and, and so that, you know, when you look at the, the realities that the party's dealing with, with the George Santoses and, um, the Marjorie Taylor Greens and now the Scott Adams is how, how, how does this party begin to put together a cohesive net? No, check that. How do presidential candidates put together a cohesive narrative to convince the country to trust their leadership in 2025? Uh, I don't know how they do that, Michael, with this cast of characters. Uh, I want to go. I want to go back because everyone said something really interesting, and and I've got some stuff to say. Sure, so do it. Go so, ahead. So um, so Ronna McDaniel and her loyalty pledge, and you mentioned the autopsy, the from 2012. Right. Mm -hmm. I remember at the time writing a column that said, you know, this autopsy is, is you know, they have some great things in it, but l let's not forget. You do autopsies on dead things. <laughs> and that was a joke in 2012. And that was when the party was still alive. Yeah. Now yeah. it's for real. It is, the party is dead. Yeah. Why are you sitting on that porch with the front light and the I, rifle is beyond me. I, but, that's, but that's between I'm hoping, you. I'm hoping the corpse rings the bell. <laughs> it's the porch of a funeral home, Michael. Right? That, yes, exactly. Right? And then when it comes to, you know, Tara, you, your point about the news media taking, like pretending like everything is okay and let's treat Ron DeSantis normally, let's treat these Republicans as if everything is okay, took me back to when I was watching Sarah Huck, Governor Sarah Huckabee Sanders response to the State of the Union. Then I'm there on the set of PBS and, you know, Amna goes to David Brooks first. Well, what do you think about her thing? And he gives this very nice and considered opinion about, you know, she talked about this and she talked about that, but she didn't talk about the economy. And that is a problem for Republicans if they don't talk about the economy. Right. Then they go to Amy Walter and she's also just giving her the perfect, you know, well, I see that this and this, that. And then Amna comes to me and says, I see you writing furiously. I was like, David, you know what? I'm glad you took her speech seriously because I couldn't. Right. Because she, you know, you know, went after trans people and then had the nerve to laud the Little Rock Nine when she's part of a party and she herself have signed executive orders to make it impossible to teach why the Little Rock Nine should be revered. Thank mm -hmm. you. I mean, so that's the problem, like, right, Jonathan? Like, the, right. why don't people mention the absolute hypocrisy of these people instead of saying, like, taking what they said for face value and not putting in context of all right. the hypocritical shit these people have said on record for years? It's right. crazy. And they so mentioned the hypocrisy, but Fox News viewers will never be told about the hypocrisy. And, and no. the hypocrisy that's the other thing. It's only and apparent to those who are listening outside the bubble. And then that gets to my larger point. You are not going to have um, old school Republicans, no Larry Hogan's, no Charlie Baker's, no Michael Steele's. I mean, folks wanted you to run for governor of Maryland, Mr. Yeah, Steele, and you sat out because the party is cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. <laughs> but what we know now- as And they're not that the crazy about chocolate, so we, <laughs> 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 we understand. Notice, <laughs> notice I didn't say- chocolate cocoa puffs yeah, that's right. um, but the dominion lawsuit against fox gets to the bigger issue here yeah yes. mccarthy has done what he's done mtg is able to do what she's able to do and say scott adams is able to do all these things because it's about power and right now we always thought that the power was in the hands of fox news and the politicians who did what Rupert Murdoch or Roger Ailes wanted them to do or say. Before it was like chicken and egg, who, which comes first? 
The right. Dominion lawsuit now says to me anyway, the Fox audience is now driving everything. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so Kevin McCarthy lives in fear of his base. His base is now so conservative that now Fox News lo lives in fear of, le of losing them and so goes off the flat earth. And so as long as Kevin McCarthy does whatever he does for power's sake, we are going to be in this position. He is probably going to let this country default because he is afraid of his base. He is afraid of that now non-Fox News watcher. Maybe they're watching Newsmax or whatever else is out there, but wherever they're broadcasting from, it's, you know, it's either off the flat earth, underside the flat earth. Right. I don't know how, like, where do... Like, where are these folks getting their news? Well, it, where they're, getting, they're, it getting, they're getting their news from a very narrow funnel. Um, and it is it is being driven. Um, and it's really interesting because the, the way I've kind of concluded or rather assessed this is at, you know, at, at a certain point, you know, the news would 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 drive stories and stories would sort of feed off of the news that was being created. So an event would happen, people would write about it and it would kind of go from there. Now they just make shit up and then they backfill with yes. storylines to prop up and affirm the lie that they put out there. Um, and that's where Fox has served its best purpose for, for, for the GOP and a lot of that's now being exposed in the conversations that we're seeing in text messages and emails between all these all these idiots um, who, on the one hand, are saying, oh, my God, no, we can't do this. But then on the other hand, when a red light comes on, tells the country the exact same thing. They say, oh, no, we can't do. So so so, John, you've got to to pivot off of what Jonathan just touched on. You've got Ron DeSantis. Um, and I'm not going to talk about him in the context of a presidential campaign, but in his primary role as governor, egging and urging the, the Republican-led uh, legislature in Florida to push to weaken state laws, to have long protected journalists and, and uh, uh, journalist, uh, journalism organizations against defamation. So you're beginning to see now the response to uh, Dominion by yes. Ron DeSantis to say, okay, we're now going to weaken the laws that would protect these journalists so they can't sue. These companies can't come after, after us when we you know, go after a Dis Disney. This is the next play, right? I and mean, this, yeah. this is where life uh, and art get blurred to the point where there are no clear delineations and distinctions anymore. Well, that's Ron DeSantis, right? The boy who cried woke. And, you know, <laughs> I mean, when you look at what he's doing, he is so hell-bent on being the smarter Trump, not realizing that it's very easy to be the smarter Trump and still long-term not be too smart. Uh, you, you left out that Ron DeSantis thought it would be a good idea for the Republican Party to begin attacking private businesses for yes. expressing their points of view uh, when it comes to, you know, not being abusive to transgender children. Ron, Ron DeSantis is going to keep all of us safe from trans children who want to play sports. And you have to understand, in real America, that's what we care about. We care about wokeism and trans kids who might want to play sports. But it's amazing to think, and I, I do believe, Tara, that DeSantis is the pick of the establishment. I, I, oh, I thought yes. January 6th hearings that uh, there were times when I thought this is Republican staffers talking to Liz Cheney about how to solve Mitch McConnell's Trump problem. So right. I do. I mean, the Cokes aren't giving Trump any more money. By the way, Trump did it first. Trump went after private business in, in the White House. He was going after he, he wanted to charge more for Amazon. He was doing anything he could. I never thought right. I'd live to. And see went after the Washington Trump Post. Was. Yeah, when a Republican would attack private business, but it shows how desperate DeSantis is. It shows his complete lack of game and his lack of long term thinking. I mean, he'll be ridiculed for all this woke business for the racism that it is within 15 years. I mean, there's a very short shelf life on this little racist clique that he's formed attacking a term begun by African-Americans to denote 
awareness of systemic racism. But what's going on now in Dominion is going to be amazing because we're going to find out whether it's okay for media to openly and knowingly lie. And there is still a very good chance, even after Rupert's deposition, that they all walk away clean from this. And of course, the Fox News audience will never know. They just rejected that ad uh, showing how they were lied to by their anchors. The Fox won't air the won't air it. The bubble will remain intact regardless of what happens because all the all all the lies, all the corruption, all the hypocrisy can be proven. But that low information voting base will still not know it. Where do they think this goes? How do they, I mean? If when when news organs are, are are sitting out here pushing out. Lies, and, and I know a lot of folks on the right, because I've been in this room for a number of years, and so have you, Tara, particularly on mm -hmm. the communication side, going back to the, the late 80s and the 90s, where there was this, this churning about, you know, how the mainstream media doesn't give our people a fair shake. And and I got that, because there was some level of truth. We didn't see conservative philosophy and points of view necessarily reflected in news stories in a in a fair space all the time. I got that. But now the script seems to have flipped the other way, where we have become the very thing that we once protested against, where oh. we've now sort of gone after those very same institutions that we claimed came after us and seem to be justifying our 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 behavior, our tearing down the First Amendment rights and principles, our tearing down of free speech around this this fake bullshit argument about woke do yeah. they do they uh, do these white folks understand where woke comes from it is it, it is it is not some sort of liberal you know screed against conservatives it's how black people communicated about white behavior <laughs> it's how we warned ourselves that mean back 100 years of the <laughs> racism around us yes. so that we could protect ourselves against it. This was not some, some you know, laboratory, uh, you know, made up CRT crap that these guys claim that, you know, now they want to take it and again, use it against us. So where do they think this goes? Any you know, other? Michael, it's so frustrating, again, because you look at this, the Republicans have absolutely, particularly conservatives, have become everything they claim to despise, everything. As someone who listened to lots of Mark Levin, who actually worked for Glenn Beck at one point, um, who was you know, on the conservative Republican side for 25 years, and listen to all these people who talked about the Constitution and, you know, uh, Bill Buckley's and and Russell Kirk's version of conservatism and empowering the individual and 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 free market economies and all of this, right? I believed all of that. That's how I became a conservative, and I was very excited about taking those concepts and and applying them in real world policy situations where I firmly believe that those were the ant better answers to our pursuit of happiness as a country, right? Come to find out that all of that was bullshit. Mark Levin and Glenn Beck and all the rest of them, they don't believe any of that. Rush Limbaugh, they didn't believe it, none of that. They, it, yeah. it was all a means to an end for power and influence because there's no way that after all those decades of what they preached and claiming to be the conservative intelligentsia that they could possibly get behind an apostate like Donald Trump and now the entire MAGA movement, which is a nationalist, populist, racist movement here in this country that is a direct existential threat to our constitutional order and our democracy. Thank Everything you. that these guys preached, we should be against. They are now the enablers of it. I call them Vichy Republicans. And it's like, what what are we doing here? What do they think is the end, the end game, right? The country is browning, whether they like it or not. A whole lot more people are gonna look like me, biracial, mixed race people, you know, by 2050, they're gonna look a whole lot more like you, me, and Jonathan. Sorry, John, but it's that's the okay. truth, right? That's what driving, and that's what driving that, John's got the good hair, so that, yes, that, 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 that they're scared driving to death. everything. 2045 right? is the number driving everything yeah. in 2050. Yes. Right. Yeah. And they fear it. They fear it. So they have to create these boogeymen all the time to keep this this dying, shrinking demographic in fear of being replaced. And we hear this. This is what they say. I mean, you look at what Ron DeSantis is doing in Florida, right, with all of these things between the, the, the Disney thing is fascism. 
<laughs> of all of the stuff, like the government coming in and, and political <laughs> retribution of a private company and then dismantling it and putting in their cronies to run it the way they want to is a form of fascism. Because I'll tell you what, it sure as hell isn't capitalism. So what are they doing? Glenn Youngkin now, who was supposed to be one of the other establishment normies, which of course we warned against, Lincoln Project warned against it. We've been warning against this all the time. They, they don't exist anymore. There's no such thing as an, a normal establishment Republican. Glenn Youngkin is now taking a page out of Ron DeSantis' book and yes. examining AP African-American courses in Virginia. So I these mean, people, this is what they're, the path they're following. The what are they doing? African-American courses ever do to white people? I but don't he's not. He's Educate not. Them. He, He's not examining African-American AP courses. He's focus grouping how white voters feel about the sentence Glenn Youngkin is examining. Yes, <laughs> yes. same thing with CRT. He, that's very true, John. He did the same yeah. thing with CRT. And Lincoln Project, we were we got you know yelled at for being very provocative by saying all of the CRT nonsense is just the code word for the N-word. This That's is it. the modern day version of Lee Atwater's Southern strategy and yeah. the way they use the N word. This is the code for that. Same thing with yeah, critical Wolf. race. Yeah, it's come to mean uncritical of racism theory. Right. Ah, uh, mm -hmm. yes. Right. And meanwhile, means, Jonathan's means having lunch on the veranda. No, I, Arizona, so. no uh, well, no, I was about to say is, is <laughs> can I eat in the barbershop? I'm sorry. You can eat in the barbershop. <laughs> I mean, you right. tell me, when, no. when have you not eaten in a barbershop, right? Uh, I mean, <laughs> you know, when you have 50, 11 jobs, you got to yeah. get. <laughs> You got to fit lunch in wherever you can. So that's, I no, that's why I've I'll, got my cup here. I'm all good. This is lunch. I'll, I'll sweep up the crumbs um, <laughs> when, when I leave. You know, <laughs> as part of this conversation, and I'm glad you brought up, you know, just the, the, the excuse me. <laughs> the <failure. laughs> we get you to that time? I'm sorry. Yeah, is no, I'm sorry. no, he's gone. The, the, oh, we can, he's gone. We bells go right there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The lack of dormy Republicans and how like we've got to look at them for who they are and what they are. Also, what we have to do, and this is something that drives me crazy, is this new thing that some report came out about Democrats' failure to reach working class voters yes. in the Midwest. Can we please, reading the story, I kept at wanting someone to put in a line defining working class Midwest voter. Because if it is, if what you're really saying is white voters, please <laughs> just say it. So I can, you know, stop doing all the work of discounting everything that you're saying. Right. Because <laughs> if, if the advice to the Democratic Party is, Here's what you need to do to get those, you know, working class Midwest voters. Well, what you're really saying to the Democratic Party is continue to ignore the base of your party that either has been voter suppressed out of going to vote or has become so, so upset and cynical that they don't even want to try to vote. So that you can go after, as what Tara was saying before, this narrow sliver of the electorate who ain't going to vote for you anyway. Right. right. Mm -hmm. And if we've learned anything about the about the midterm elections we just went through, the American electorate is a lot more nuanced and sophisticated than we give them credit for. And so, so and so. so Go ahead. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. This is your barbershop. No, sorry. no, no. You no, do go ahead. I'll finish your point because you you were walking me right up to the door I wanted to go through next. Go ahead. Oh, so damn it, Steel! I lost my train of thought. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Pick it up. Pick it up, then, Michael. Go ahead. Want, Since no. I was walking up to the door, <laughs> well, you no, were you, well, were, you no. were just finishing your entree. Yeah. And, and... <laughs> <laughs> Go well, ahead, Mike. The, those clippers going to be cut really close to where you move your head around. But anyway, the, <laughs> the no, it, it, it really kind of gets us right up to what the voters are going to vote for. And so that that leads me to the the cavalcade of of candidates that are lining up potentially to run and those who've already entered the race and and. Uh, both John and Tara had uh, very, very interesting takes on the entrance of one Nikki Haley, 
who was the mm -hmm. first into the pool against Trump. Let's take a, take a quick listen to a little bit of my friend uh, Jonathan Fugel saying on his podcast. She gave her statement today, um, we're not going to play it. But she said in her video, I was the proud daughter of Indian immigrants, not black, not white. I was different. So she's going for the Trump fans who love immigrants demographic, which is kind of like going for the people who love Ultimate Fighting Championship and Lindsey Graham. She said, some look at our past as evidence that America's founding principles are bad. <laughs> no, some look at our past as evidence that slavery and Jim Crow and segregation and apartheid are bad, and some Republicans don't want to talk about it. But this is the whole thing, right? She's a new kind of Republican. She's not Trump. I wasn't aware there'd be a gotcha clip of my own voice and words thrown at me. Uh, I wasn't aware <laughs> of that gotcha question. Dude, and not only not only was it a good clip, but you sound so sexy. Kind of dovetails what, what Tara had to say. Um, let's go here. Well, I mean, I, I can't speak on behalf of the Indian American community because I'm not part of that, but I can see where the comparisons would be to where oftentimes Republicans will try to use immigrants or minorities as tokens to try to deflect away from policies and positions that are actually um, uh, exclusive of those communities. And Nikki Haley is no different than a lot of the rest of them. I mean, it's the same thing with the Ben Carsons of the world or, or the Herschel Walkers, where they think, oh, if they just put a black candidate up there to say, oh, there's no more racism, that white people go, yeah, see, that's okay. We're not racist anymore because the black guy said there's no more racism. You know, it's just, it's really incredulous and, and quite transparent. And when Nikki Haley says that, oh, you know, she grew up on the other side of the tracks and how the tracks divided the community, well, who the hell does she think put the tracks there? <laughs> there's no racism in America? I guess the tracks just showed up through immaculate construction. I mean, it's, 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 it's an asinine position and very transparent. Oh my God! That's right? How the Naculate hell does she think? Right? How the hell does she? Who does she think put the tracks there? They get there by immaculate construction. So, so we have this. We have this. This. This landscape. And actually, the Marjorie Taylor Greene piece is an important centerpiece here because she's talking about breaking apart the country. Yes. She's talking about dividing us. So you have a Nikki Haley who's talking about coming from the other side of the tracks and this brown and black America and, and all of this, uh, we're going to see others do the same thing, say the same thing. I can't wait to Ron DeSantis ta start talking about how he wants to unify black people. Oh, please. Well, Tim, they already have Tim Scott. <laughs> oh, they got there, Tim Scott. They, they got they, Tim they, Scott. They, they don't pushed, have Tim Scott you know, for that. Senator so, uh, Mushmouth, Senator Mushmouth, they already put him out uh, there too. Senator Mushmouth will be the next GOP VP nominee. I'll, I don't know who the nominee will be, but Tim Scott will be the VP. I disagree. I it's going to be a woman. For this, but it's okay. this very reason you just so ably outlined in that tape, they need the what me racist guy up there on stage with them. It's going to be a woman because they Senator Tim Scott has the personality of a doorknob. He is not they, they he's not flashy enough because Donald Trump will be the nominee and he is not going to stand up there with Tim Scott. I'm telling you right now, he'd rather have Herschel Walker be his vice presidential yeah, candidate than I Tim Scott. You. I would got, but you've got to go in like Scott will still, Tim Scott will still be in the race oh. long after Nikki Haley has joined. Yeah. Him. Oh, he'll be the Ben Carson of this of this uh of this segment. Yeah. Oh. oh. Yeah. Now oh. you're insulting the guy. Damn. Damn. <laughs> but it's, I mean, let's just be not... honest. What is Tim, Tim we haven't heard Tim Scott talk this much in God knows how long for a reason. And so I mean, you know, he 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 might be going on the tour here. But there's only but so much he's going to say. At least Ben Carson had a, you know, a, a moving story about being a surgeon and where he came from. I mean, Tim Scott is he doesn't tell the stories the same way and doesn't have the same gravitas. So, I mean, yeah. I, I Tim Scott, once again, it's a vanity candidacy. He doesn't stand a chance in hell. And the point I made about Marjorie Taylor Greene also is that and Nikki Haley is that. Marjorie Taylor Greene has a greater chance of being the Republican presidential nominee than M Nikki Haley does right that's now. True. That's true. That's true. I think mm -hmm. that I think that's a true statement. But it does it does for me, Jonathan. Um, I don't want to get you a mid true, but it does it does for me <laughs> beg the question of <laughs> you know this this idea that we you know. It's like what they did with Congressman Donald. We're gonna run. We're gonna put his name in the nomination for Speaker of the House. Yes. The, the cynicism that it just 
And that fool just... let himself be used as the token, which is the most frustrating part of bra- about it. It's like, come but on, they... brother, you know better. What are you yeah, doing? Yeah, I mean, it, it's like, I, 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 I agree with Fugel saying, I, I think if I'm looking at the two of them, I agree with John that it likely will fall more to a Tim Scott than a Nikki Haley for the number two spot because of that cynicism. Because at the end of the day, the question, the thinking is that a Tim Scott is going to draw more black men to the table yes. than a Nikki Haley will. Because that's how they think black people think. Right. Hence Herschel Walker. They think women think. Right. Hence Herschel Walker. And so you you find this find this sort of cynical approach to race politics by these type of MAGA Republicans that I, I just don't know how they think that's going to sell. I mean, Tim Scott had a moment, in my view, to make the case to his caucus in the Senate and to the party as a whole to stand with the Democrats that he was working with to get a criminal justice bill On done. criminal justice, yeah. And, and he was told, that's not the water we want you to carry. Take right. this bucket. And he did. Right, and he did. And so now he's going to come into our community and say what? He's going to come into your community and say how many times he's been pulled over for being black. Then he's going to go on Fox and say there's no racism in America because that's what he's been doing for the last 10 years. Yep. Yeah, I guess that Hmm. that, that kind of sums it up. And I think to your point, though, um, John and and Michael, that I don't think he necessarily brings in more black men because black men are going to look at him and go, "Um, no. There's exactly. the, he gives a permission structure to the white people yeah. that that they need to solidify to say, well, Republicans really aren't racist. Like the woke exactly. stuff and CRT, that's not really racist. The black guy's on the on the ticket, exactly. so he wouldn't be yeah. in you know acting against right. his own interest. Even though I always say that cognitive dissonance is a hell of a drug. Mm-hmm. Jonathan, and that explain and that explains Herschel Walker right there. Yes, that's yes. why, and and that's why Herschel Walker was closer than he should have been Mm -hmm. in that runoff race with with Warnock because he was setting up the permission structure for white voters to say, I'm going to vote. You can't say I'm racist for not voting for the black guy because I voted for the black guy, even though the black guy can't do TV without having minders on either side. And when he does speak, he makes no sense. And also keep in mind, not all of the Republicans who turned out to vote for the Republican governor pulled the lever for Herschel Walker. That's correct. I mean, it should not have been a runoff if all the Republicans voted R down the board. There were plenty who voted for their governor and did not vote for Herschel. Well, thank God for that, at least. At the Lincoln Project, we call those the people, the Bannon line voters, right? The four to eight percent of Republicans who are who refuse to vote for the Trumps or the crazies because they realize that, you know, that that it's actually a danger to the country. Those are the people that will make the difference in a lot of these close races, which is who we target all the time. But it, you're right, Jonathan, that race should never have been as close as it was. And you know, and it's not even just the fact that he can't put a sentence together. The guy is a freaking scofflaw, violent tendencies, domestic abuser, absentee father, like everything that Conservatives claim that they're supposed to be against again, but oh, but if right. he's black, right. he's the new side, father figure oh, wait, of the GOP. Yeah, then, Every way right, they demonize are, black men, just, they'll overlook if it's for their own power. Correct. Right. Yeah. And not just and not just an absentee father, a mystery father. Right. Every day there is yeah. like a new kid. Right. Oh, Hi, Dad. Well, come on. Oh. <laughs> I was waiting for Herschel Walker to reveal an out of wedlock child with Elon Musk. That would have been. <laughs> <laughs> Now I wonder how the how the conservatives would have handled that. Yeah, they, yeah, they probably would have wet their they pants. Never would have heard about it. That's so so if you if you think the Republicans are a shit show, uh, when we come back, we're going to talk about the fact that on paper, President Biden has been one of the most productive and successful Democratic presidents in modern history. And why that seems to be a problem for so many Democrats. We'll be back with with Tara, Jonathan, and John right after this. Welcome back, everybody, to the Michael Steele Podcast. And we are at the barbershop with Jonathan uh, Jonathan Capehart, John Fugelsang, and Tara Setmayer. And so we want to shift the gears 
after um, getting a far too close shave with the GOP, now we get to do some styling, some cleanup, some some poofy, so boffy bone kind of moving the piece around with the Democrats because they got their shit together, right? I mean, look at this. I mean, you've got President Biden, who's appointed over a federal, a hundred federal judges, which is more than Obama, Clinton, and and um uh, George W. Bush, uh, you've got, uh, what else? You've got uh, 300 pieces of legislation that have bipartisan legislation that he's gotten passed, where he's actually gotten Republicans to vote with him. Um, unemployment is, is drop, dropping. Infrastructure bill, he's got- uh, Inflation Reduction Act. Inflation Reduction Act. Fix Act, PACT Act, most jobs in the first two years. Right. Dude, so like, right? I get shit done. He's like a lesbian Scientologist. He gets a lot done in the <laughs> day. <laughs> I'm like, hey, can we run a 100 year old president and see how much shit that guy gets done? My God. <laughs> it goes to show how much a president can achieve when he's not thinking about his mistress or his next job. I just want to point that out. He gets a lot done. <laughs> but, 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 here's, here's the but. So our buddy Mark Leibovich uh, wrote today, wrote yesterday in the Atlantic, quote, in private, many elected Democrats say Biden is too old to run again and that they wish he'd step away, which aligns with what large majorities of Democrats and independents have been telling pollsters for months. The public silence around the president's predicament has become tiresome and potentially catastrophic for the Democratic Party. What the hell is wrong with these people? Oh, Jonathan. so much disarray. <laughs> okay, look. <laughs> this, you you have put out a soapbox and I am about to climb a top. <laughs> <clears throat> this is something Democrats do every four years, whether they have a person in the White House or not. There's always something wrong with the person that you've got to run off and find the better, better candidate. It, <laughs> Joe Biden, in three years, you just laid out the case. On paper, in practice, in real life, the man deserves another term. Yes. The man deserves to be the Democratic nominee for 2024. Nobody should be fixing their lips to say anything on the record, off the record, on deep background, nothing about him not running for pre running for president again. Democrats are always circling the wagons, shooting at each other. Meanwhile, do you think for a hot minute that if Joe Biden were a Republican, that Republicans would be having this conversation? Never, no. never, never, never. Hell no. Never. Absolutely not. And so the other thing is, these, I'm not going to curse because <laughs> all of you have done it, but these folks, they are so looking for the one. This is, this is the main democratic affliction, the one. They're always looking for the one. Meanwhile, the one who has the job is completely ignored, yeah. is shunned to the yeah. side is said, oh no, you're too old, or you're too liberal, or you're too this, or you're too that, instead of focusing in on the fact that, okay, what y'all want? You want to raise the minimum wage? You want um, uh, paid family leave? You want uh, the earned income tax credit? How do you get that done? Okay, you have a divided Congress, but you got the president. The only way you're going to get those things done is if a president from your party signs, signs that law. bill. Signs the bill. You got the That's man. Right. You you know how hard and the it judges, is to, the judges, Jonathan. Judges. People don't understand the influence that the appointment of lifelong federal judges. Yes. The influence that that has on, pub, over on the, public policy, on pub, public policy, and influence right. everybody's lives. We care about. Right. right, and especially with Congress so broken, every Congress, I mean, courts are doing all the legislating now. Yeah, and so these jokers within the Democratic Party who are muling and whining about Joe Biden being eighty, I wish I would be in the middle of a live address to the nation and have Republicans boo me and have the presence of mind to jack them up on live TV.
I mean, that's right. amazing. That's, it was the most amazing old. thing I've ever old. seen the president to negotiate with a, a hostile Republican party. Mm-hmm. Rope it up them. To negotiate Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security off the table. Just tell right them, oh, we're, we're all agreed. We're not doing that, right? Right. right. He goes, I and love conversions. Stand yes. up applauding. That yeah. right there alone should have shut, shut everybody Democrats up. Democrats the that's hell right. up. That's so right. John, Listen, so, so John, why didn't it? Why why didn't it shut him up? Well, there's two schools of thought on this, right? There's the school that says he's he's too old. Um, and you're right, that's a democratic problem. I remember watching Ronald Reagan, the oldest president in history, run for re-election. Donald Trump was the oldest president in history when he ran for re-election. Um, but Biden's special. Um, you know, the ageism is going to be a thing no matter what. And Democrats will be a part of that no matter what. Uh, but that's also part of the purity test. The other side is, well, he's not liberal enough. We'll be hearing that all over the place. And, and I understand that. I know how frustrating it is for liberals to watch the Democratic Party. But I mean, it's those purity tests that got Donald Trump elected. It was a couple thousand pure liberals in Wisconsin who don't have uteruses in 2016. And that's why Roe v. Wade is over. So there comes a time when you've got to realize that sometimes being an adult is choosing the lesser of two evils. That's all of adulthood. Picking your dessert is choosing the lesser of two evils. And sometimes you've got to realize, like Tara said, what about the greater good? Who's going to appoint more justices who will support the accused over the cops, who will support labor over management, who will support a clean earth over polluters? Biden's influence is going to be like the Big Bang and continue to expand. And unless you have someone that you think is a lock, to beat whoever Ron DeSantis or Trump, then sit down, please, because Joe Biden probably will get a defender, uh, uh, someone opposing him, and it'll probably be very harmonious, and it'll be someone who doesn't ever attack Joe Biden too hard, just wants to bring another voice. Believe me, he'll get a challenger. It will make him look stronger. The challenger will go on to have a great career after this, <laughs> and they will jump through that hoop for the Democratic electorate. Personally, you know who I want to see, Chad? Dianne Feinstein. This would be a great time for her to run for president. <laughs> against Joe Biden and all these concerns go away, people. Oh my goodness. Listen, I, look, I am with Jonathan on this where I just sit back and, and Michael, you and I know this. I mean, Republicans know how to fall in line. Yeah, That was something that Republicans were so good at that Democrats, my Democratic friends would always go, how do y'all do that? I don't understand how we can't do it. No, it yeah. doesn't matter. You, The perfect example is Donald freaking Trump. Yeah. If there was ever a time for Republicans no. to not go lockstep and not join in and fall in line, it was fucking Donald Trump. Yep. But they did. So you know if Republicans can get behind Donald Trump and who who was, like I said, an apostate on paper for everything that the party claimed to stand for, from the sanctimonious pricks like, like Ted Cruz and Mike Lee and the rest of them, all the way down to the Ari Fleischers and the, the Bush world establishment folks that, that got in line. If they can do that for Donald Trump, why in the hell can't Democrats take a page out of that book and stand behind a very successful Democratic president who has done an, ex- an extraordinary job of trying to put the pieces back together after Donald Trump tried to destroy this country, literally? I mean, I don't understand I, this. Uh, it, and who it, do they have? And the, and the other part, too, of this is. Who do they have? They don't have a viable alternative. Don't. They, they don't. do not. Well, so Tara, and if they that's, did, that's then, 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 you know, then Biden probably could have said, I've done my job. I'm ready to hand it off. But they made a certain decision to not build up their bench properly. Well, they, and they, it's, they, they have a bench. They, have, they, they have a bench. They have a bench. They have a bench. They have a bench. Well, but that's not they've who got, they they've got the as vice, vice president. president. They've got Governor Whitmer. But, they've but got. We they... all know that Kamala Harris doesn't stand a chance as so a. Gavin a Newsom could. Gavin Newsom could destroy Trump or. Oh DeSantis. sure. So could Mitch Landrew. Oh, so could Peter Buttig- but Pete see, Buttigieg, but is... who I love. But they, but they're not in a position to leapfrog the current vice president. They created they're... themselves a little political problem here yeah. with that. Well, yeah. the, well the, so they're not in a position for two reasons. They're not in a position, as you say, to leapfrog the vice president. That's one. But the reason they're not in a position to leapfrog the, the vice president is because they're not in a position to take down the sitting incumbent president of the United States. Right. Why? No, he would have to be, be- in on it. Be- he would have well, to make the decision. Well, no, because if, if Biden had been incompetent, 
if Biden had not rack, racked up the successes, if he'd only been able to get three uh, judicial nominations through right. the Senate, instead of if he'd only been if he plus. if he couldn't get infrastructure bill done, if you know, so it was still infrastructure. We had the lowest childhood poverty rate in history in 2021. Exactly. And kept kept control of the Senate the first exactly. time. Exactly. So if he weren't able to do those things, then it would be much more of a free for all. But right. the fact that the Gavin Newsom's and the Governor Whitmer's and so forth have not aligned themselves with this thinking inside the party to challenge him should tell you that the guy is formidable, that the guy has got the game to prosecute. That's his um, biggest strength. Joe Biden's biggest strength has always been the low expectations and his yeah. second biggest strength has always been drawing a contrast, folks between what I stand for and what the other guy stands for. Watch yeah. his Paul Ryan debate. It's a masterpiece of calm and strategy. Biden is not afraid of any of this because he knows ultimately he's not, he's going to be what, 82? But regardless whether it's Trump or DeSantis, he's going to be running against 95-year-old Herbert Hoover economics. It doesn't matter who the Republican <laughs> nominee is. He'll be, Biden will be the young guy ideologically in this <laughs> So the young so, guy defending democracy, by the way, which is something else that Republicans right. have abandoned. They're yeah. they're a pro-Putin, pro-authoritarian, illiberal party now that gives a platform to people like Viktor Orban and and Bolsonaro in in Brazil, um, and and excoriates uh, uh, Zelensky, who is out yeah. here literally fighting for mm -hmm. every concept of democracy that Republicans claim to to lay their foundation of the party on. What, what is going on? You have so we have, you know, um, Biden has that also the moral high ground just on the esoteric concept of democracy as America being that beacon and America supporting democracy around the world. He has that to stand on also. Yeah, Roe v. To, Wade. It, well, th th there's you know that as well. well I mean, there's just know, so many things, but but Democrats it's still not good enough. Yeah, but the, the, John, you raise an interesting point because the Roe v. Wade piece is a very it, it is one of the the more interesting pieces in this in this um democratic small d democratic puzzle because what i discovered what i learned over the last well since the decision uh in june of last year was that there were as many pro-life republican especially republican women who were off put by that decision who have yes. who voted against republicans who espouse a national ban, um, draconian yes. uh, laws, you know, holding women criminally liable, et cetera. And I think yeah. the party still hasn't wrapped its head around that piece. And how do we know that? Because just in this la in the opening of this session, they doubled down with introducing more anti-women legislation around abortion. Yeah. So Look, how the Gallup poll in 2012 is the one I always go back to that showed that 77% of Americans support abortion rights in all or some cases, but only 43% of Americans would call themselves pro-choice because they don't feel comfortable with that language. And that's what choice is all about. That's my parents. My parents would never vote for an anti-abortion politician, but they would never call themselves pro-choice. And there's a lot of folks and a lot of Christians who are very uncomfortable with this and not to hijack the whole conversation, but Democrats need to realize uh, the Bible, not against abortion. Judaism, Jesus's religion, not against abortion. The Bible never calls for you to harass women outside clinics, put women in jail, have the state force teenage rape victims to carry and bear their attackers' children. None of that's religion. The Democrats' problem is they've allowed the Republican Party to take the Bible and ignore everything Christ talked about and then pretend Christ's message is actually about criminalizing abortion and being shitty to trans kids and the Christian refugees at our border, they call illegals. If the Democratic Party would stop being afraid of just embracing what's in the Bible, they can take it away from the GOP because it is a malformed, mutated version of Christianity, a Christ who did oppose the death penalty more than once, but never mentioned abortion. That yeah. is the Republican Party's magic charm they use to claim virtue no matter what. I ask all of the right-wing Republicans who call my show, give me one specific gospel teaching of Christ this party has fought for in the last 30 years. I've never had an accurate answer because most of them haven't read the Jesus parts of the Bible. No, they haven't. Shame <laughs> on the Democrats if they yeah, allow yeah. the Republicans to get away with this.
Jonathan, I, I want to I want to flip it to you on in terms of your colleagues um, throughout the industry, not just in terms of print media, but television. You are an anchor of a successful show. Congratulations! Now you've got uh, Saturday and Sunday uh, the you know the the Jonathan Capehart Hour, as I like to say, as we yeah. get up and have our coffee at nine a.m. Um, um, what what why does the media um, just taking aside from the from the points that John made about the politics and Tara made about the politics, the media still kind of writes this narrative in a way that gives a lot of credence to what John was noting. You know, they they take the the Bible thumper who's not read the Bible and write those stories as if they're gospel, as if they're, they they really are. But it is a gross interpretation or misinterpretation of of those teachings. And that sort of fuels that narrative. And and so how how does the press play a role in sort of just sort of being the, the umpire and just calling the balls and strikes as opposed to um, setting a setting a table that is sort of slanted one way or the other, whether it's more towards a conservative perspective or taking this sort of, um, you know, abortion on demand, you do use that one as a, as an uh, example. Okay. So you've given, you've given me some mixed metaphors here because on the I, one I, hand, I'm, I'm good at that. I'm good at <clears throat> On the one hand, you said you wanted a press that would just you know, tell the facts, you know, call the right. balls and strikes. But then you said you don't want, you know, media that falls on one side or the other or like sets up a narrative that makes you think one thing or the other. Um, what we have to do, I mean, it's a twofold problem. I'll say I'll, I'll start with the media first. We have gotten to a situ to a point in our society because of the internet, where there are no more there are no more referees. I mean, oh. there there are more than three television networks. There are more than three national newspapers. There are people get their information from myriad sources, mm -hmm. and not all of them accurate. Most of them not accurate. And then when you try to tell people, no, you really should read the New York Times, you really should read the Washington Post, you really should read the Wall Street Journal, you really should read the Los Angeles Times, they'll say, oh no, that's that's the liberal media. No, I, I know I'm not. I I'm not going to trust them. I'd rather trust Herb on Facebook. <laughs> this is this is this is part of the problem. One th one bright spot I saw during during the Trump years is that a bunch of people who were taking this guy seriously or not seriously, meaning like, oh, he's a joke, then he becomes president. And then I watched in real time as a White House press corps that gave Barack Obama the blues for wearing a tan suit, Boom. suddenly realized yeah. that the White House was using the briefing room to spread lies and disinformation. And then suddenly those folks realized, oh, hold up. We're the front line for the First Amendment. Right. We can't let him just stand up, let these people stand up there and say these things. We have to push back. But once media starts pushing back and saying, you know, that was the president. He just said two plus two equals five. As we all know, two plus two does not equal five. It equals four. Suddenly, that news side reporter is viewed as biased. Mm -hmm. I agree that we need to have more reporters who are willing to call out dis disinformation and lies in real time because it does a disservice to the audience if you don't. It yes. does a disservice to the profession if you don't. And it gives unbelievable power to the executive, which that's what we're there for, to be, to be part of the check on the executive. Now, the flip side, and this is, I'm climbing back on my soapbox again. The media consumer has as much responsibility now because of this disaggregated way we get our news, has a responsibility to be more sophisticated and more nuanced in how they're reading the news. They have got to get their news from multiple sources. Just because you read the New York Times doesn't mean you shouldn't read the Washington Post and vice versa or shouldn't read the Wall Street Journal editorial page. 
to see what they have to say about things. There is no right way or wrong way to write about particular issues. If you, when I was in New York and something big happened in New York City, especially if it was juicy and salacious. New York Post. I, I would read the New York Times first to get the official version, the clean, respectable version. Then I would go to my paper, the New York Daily News, to get the blue collar respectable yes. version, but had a little more salt. Right. In, mm -hmm. And then if you really wanted to know the lowdown, you go to the New York Post because they will tell you everything that happened, the really juicy bits, and leave out all the other stuff that you need to know. Mm -hmm. By reading all three sort all three papers, you had a 360 view of this particular situation because you got bits and pieces of information from three different sources all reporting on the same thing. Right. News consumers, I don't t I, when I write a column, it takes me a long time because whenever I make an assertion, I make sure there's a hyperlink so that the reader can, when the reader asks, how does he know that? They can click the link and right. read where, where I'm getting this from. But as we all know, if you've ever written anything and you put it on Twitter, people start yelling at you about things that yeah. they said, you, well, you should have said this. I did, it's in the piece. You click the link. Well, how right. dare you say that? I didn't, it's a quote. Did mm -hmm. you read the piece? Exactly. And so I end up saying to people, and folks need, and, and media consumers, news consumers need to re realize this. If I wrote the way most people read, I'd be fired. Right. Yes. Journalists <laughs> put true. in such care to their reporting. Good journalists, so much care in their reporting. The least the news consumer can do is read what they've written. And then if you got a little extra time, click the hyperlinks so that you can be better informed because that's why we're doing this stuff. We're doing it for you. Well, we we are you you have done it for us. Uh, you all have that that is actually a, an excellent excellent spot for us to unfortunately bring our conversation to a close because uh, I need to let you guys go back and write and produce and create and do all the things to keep our democracy safe. One uh, phrase, one phrase to sum up that, everything Tara? Jonathan just said. Democracy is a decision and it's up it to all of us. It's an active thing that does not defend itself. So we have a responsibility for all of it. Democracy is a decision. Wow. And I just want to thank America because this week was the first time Dilbert ever made me laugh. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait for the racists to have their dark Dilbert memes. You know that's coming next. <laughs> oh, well, I'm sure Marjorie Taylor Greene will will uh, read oh from it gosh. from from the stage of CPAC this week. Watch yeah. Marjorie and, Confederate Greene, and that's why we invite this crew to the barbershop. I uh, said, so just <laughs> <laughs> leave it to John to sum it all up. I love it. I love it. John Fugel saying, actor, comedian, host of Sirius XM's Tell Me Everything in the John Fugel saying podcast. Tara Setmayer former CNN political commentator, senior advisor at the Lincoln Project and host of the live show, The Breakdown, and my good friend, Jonathan Capehart, Pulitzer surprise winning uh, journalist, member of the Washington Post, well, former member of the Washington Post editorial board. <laughs> That's a whole other conversation. That's a whole, whole other, other conversation. conversation. Uh, MSNBC contributor and the anchor of the Sunday show with uh, uh, Jonathan Capehart and the newly uh, launched the Saturday show with Jonathan Capehart. Thank you guys so much for so coming much. on to the Thanks, podcast Michael. and hanging. Uh, Jonathan, looked like you and I got a little bit too much cut off the top, but we good. <laughs> We still good. <laughs> Y'all still look good. That's what I'm saying. All right, saw, 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 right folks. Uh, follow uh, Fugel Sang at John Fugel Sang on Twitter, Tara at Tara Setmayer on Twitter, and Jonathan at K Part J on Twitter. I'm Michael Steele at Michael Steele on Twitter. Do the download thing. I love it when you do. Make me feel all yummy inside. Until next time, be safe, be well, and remember democracy is a decision. All righty. <laughs> Till next time, y'all. Take care. Bye.